So we have a little bit of time for questions this afternoon in that um, we have to be out of this room by 4.30 this afternoon. So the time is a little room, but not a lot. Um, so Um, we've got one talk first from Richard, then we'll have a, a proper 15 minute break, um, and then two talks and go into discussions after that. So we're going to move into more directly the biological part of this extravaganza, and it's a fantastic project um, here. I'll organize everything, we're going to reach out to this very much. Great, thanks very much. Does that sound okay? Yeah, that's fine. Have you got it switched on? Uh, oh yeah! Oh, right. <laughs> okay, but I will crack on. So, I'm, yes, the plan for this talk is to move things on into a more evolutionary arena. So really what I'm going to do is uh, Talk about um, predictive processing, predictive engines, really in terms of something more fundamental, which is the uh, free energy principle. Um, so first of all, I'm going to start off just with the formulation of the free energy principle. Then I'm going to look at some of the worries and problems that have been raised for uh, the principle. Broadly, in terms of the kind of worry that it's too universal, it's too broad, it seems to be doing to explain this too much. Kind of, Worry that Andy talked about in his public lecture. Um, I'm also going to talk just quickly about Markov blankets in that context. Uh, and I'm going to talk about them as idealizations rather than as kind of deep ontological categories that can tell us something importantly metaphysical about the world. And then once I've got that done quickly, I will move pretty swiftly on to. Um, the discussion about the role of the free, the free energy principle in giving us an account of evolution, especially in terms of adaptation, adaptive fitness, and so on. And then I'm going to move it into a slightly different area. So the first half of the talk to be largely critical, or even one of the more critical talks we've had so far. Um, then at the end, I want to be a little bit more positive. So I just want to move into some territory I'm trying to explore at the moment. I wouldn't say that I've got anything uh, complete or finished here, but I want to try and explore the idea that the free energy principle, the free energy principle, is quite consistent with niche construction uh, and cultural evolution, dual and triple inheritance models. Um, and I want to say if there's a way we could think about the integration of the free energy principle and cultural evolution that could be mutually reinforcing. Okay. That's what I hope to get to positively at the end. But to start with, it's going to be all good. Okay, well, we've heard um, various formulations of the free energy principle. Here's some that I've found that are really nice and straightforward. So this quite recent paper, which is a response to another paper, but it's really nice. It's a simple element idea. Living systems self-organize optimally by resisting internal entropy, that is by minimizing free energy. So they resist disorder by minimizing free energy. Right? And free energy then can be uh, understood, as in this second quote here, in terms of uh, sensory states that are implicitly predicted by those systems. And stuff that most people have been talking about so far. And the whole idea of free energy in the last quote there is that it's consistent with um, basic process of prediction error minimization and also that free energy can be given both uh, a thermodynamic formulation and also an information theoretic formalization. Right? So uh, a thermodynamic formulation in terms of the amount of work that's available for some system to do or something more like Shannon's uh, notion of entropy, his notion of uh, information. Right. I'm not going to talk about that kind of uh, consistency between those different formulations across thermodynamics and information. 
So it, the whole idea I'm just trying to get you to there is that it's um, quite a simple, elegant um, principle in itself. Now, several, uh, there's one other thing I should just say before moving on to the, the criticism. So the other thing just to say about it is that that formulation I gave you was in terms of self-organization. So I actually think that for self-organization, the free energy principle is actually quite an elegant explanation. We don't have very good explanations of self-organization of the living system. And the free energy principle seems to be a pretty good way of articulating and encapsulating that. The question is whether or not we should go broader than just self-organization. Should we go beyond self-organization to adaptive success, for example? Now, this is the point where I just want to raise the kind of issues that um, appear to be problems for this rather general formulation of the free energy principle. So should we think of the free energy principle as a kind of causal explanation? That's where we want to be at this stage. Um, is it a kind of causal explanation? Is it mechanistic style of explanation? Or is it really just much more general and abstract? Uh, is it, a, in that sense, a principle which is guiding more mechanistic explanations of, for example, neural circuitry or property phenomena? Not itself an explanation of those things, right? But it kind of guides the more predictive processing, predictive coding style explanations that we've had from Andean and Yakov. So, um, one clear answer which has been proposed by several people to that question is, is no. It's not. It's not um, really a causal explanation at all. Um, it's not a causal account of mechanism. It's something like an idealized, idealized law. Colin Klein has said something like this in a, in a recent paper, but also since. Um, and here's a short quote from Klein on that. Um, Good explanations detail a causal story, and it's not obvious that FET does so. Right. So if that, if that kind of criticism comes good, then where, where would that leave FET? Well, there's some alternatives. I mean, one is that it is really this kind of guiding principle in the formation of more local empirical explanations. That's the kind of thing that's countenanced by SIMS. Um, but there's another alternative which I think is quite worrying and is apparent in uh, Friston's own work, right, and Friston's own formulations of the free energy principle, in that it's a kind of tautology. And consequently, it really has no explanatory power, I want to say. So, if the free energy principle is merely tautological, definitional, or descriptive, then it's not really explanatory in any deep or interesting sense. Right? But, unfortunately, Friston has claimed this status for the free energy principle in a very famous set of exchanges with um, which Annie was involved in. Um, in 2012. Uh, the tautology here is deliberate. So, like adaptive fitness, which I'll have more to say about in a minute, um, the free energy formulation is not a mechanism or a ma magic recipe for life. It is just a characterization of biological systems that exist. Now, I don't know about you, but that, that kind of formulation worries me a bit. I'm worried when I'm told that this is really just a tautology, but it's going to nevertheless do some important uh, empirical statutory work. Um, let's think about the other alternative, right? So maybe if it's like a very general law of physics that constrains and informs more local mechanistic explanations, um, such as those found in predictive processing, maybe that would be a better way of thinking of the free energy principle, a high, higher level kind of more abstract and general explanation. And since it's raised that possibility, but it also looks like it might come at a rather severe cost. Right? And uh, Collins argued for this. So the principle then would really have no empirical content. Um, it would be at best a kind of idealization and probably literally false, the way that, you know, a frictionless plane would be. So it might be useful, back to you, too, might be useful or heuristic in some ways, but but not ultimately satisfying as an, uh, an explanatory principle. 
Now, I don't think Tristan would agree with uh, either of those um, critical formulations or critical commentaries on the free energy principle. Here's a recent paper which from Jim and Hob Hobson where it says, the free energy principle applies to any scale, from a virus to an ecosystem. It goes all the way up, all the way down. It does conscious brains, it does thermodynamics, conscious brains, and the evolution of species. So in that sense, I can't see how the free energy principle could be doing those, that kind of work, that kind of organizing work, if it's just a tautology. And if it's a very, very general principle, we need to know how it's guiding our understanding of these quite different phenomena. Now, arguably, perhaps that's where the self-organizational aspect of it comes in. And that might well work in the kind of way that um, Michael was talking about yesterday. But it better not be a tautology. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to the tautology aspect when we look at um, uh, adaptive fitness, adaptive success, and Tristan's attempts to account for that in terms of free energy. But now I just want to say very quickly into the uh, discussion about Markov languages. And we've had a lot said about them, so I'm not going to say too much. Uh, oh, yeah, let's get quickly. As you're aware, the Markov languages are supposed to make this partition between internal and external states. Um, such that there can be a minimization of free energy. Right? Here, considered in terms of sensory states. So this could happen in terms of, uh, here, a cell. So we need to imagine that they're internal and external states. And they're kind of sensory and active states even for the cell. We have to think about that in terms of self-evidencing, as we saw earlier from Yakov's school. And here we are perhaps in more comfortable territory when talking about brains. So I think there's an idealization here going on, right? Which I'll cash out in more detail in a second. Right? The idealization is in treating cells and brains as collections of states which are like nodes in a Bayesian graph or Bayesian network, right? Um, with causal and statistical dependencies between them given by edges and lines. I mean, this is more complicated than standard Bayesian graphs, for, uh, quite obviously because of all the kind of looping feedback in, in inner and outer, as we saw earlier in Yakov's talk. But nevertheless, the inspiration here for the idea of the Markov blanket, the idea of hidden external states, internal states, providing models of those hidden external states and variables, and the kind of Bayesian processes that we're going to make predictions off the basis of those models about incoming sensory signals, that's nevertheless modeled on the idea of a Bayesian network, which is this collection of nodes. Right. Now, as we saw, as we've seen in discussion, uh, there are various ways of interpreting Markov blankets. Are they a hard and fast boundary between the mind and the world? We had that discussion yesterday. I don't intend to go into it in detail. Regina Fabry has um, suggested or argued that we really ought to think of this as more of a, on a more kind of development, uh, uh, dynamic system type approach where the statistical regularities, causal relations between sensory and active states and hidden variables in the environment, they're fast interactions over, over time, over quick time scales. We shouldn't really think of them as being separate um, states in that sense. Um, and Andy, of course, has famously told us how to knit our own Markov blankets in just the same kind of way. So Markov blankets, in a sense, don't present a fixed boundary. Those boundaries can shift to include other things, including, of course, I think I have the WYSI version that Yakov had earlier, but including, of course, iPhones, so sometimes the iPhone can be considered to be inside the Markov blanket, sometimes the iPhone is outside of the Markov blanket, depending on whether or not you may need to make inferences about it. So the blanket may be shifting in a sense, in the way that we've already described. Okay, so that's how a lot of the discussion of Markov blankets in the, in the philosophy of mind type literature, or philosophy of cognitive science type literature has gone. Right? I'm not yet convinced that 
uh, this is the Marco Planck is can really help do this job, whether or not they can give harm fast metaphysical boundaries in the way that have been suggested. And that's because of where the concept of Marco Planck is came from. It's introduced by Judea Pearl in a book on uh, probabilistic reasoning in intelligent systems, machine learning. Um, and really all uh, all that the Marco Planck was supposed to do in this context was, as in the bold here, uh, a way of separating a node in a Bayesian network from other nodes in the network that are not its offspring. Right? Where a Bayesian network uh, just consists of a set of nodes representing random variables, um, together with a set of directed edges from one node to another, which can be used to identify statistical dependencies between variables. So, a very artificial uh, concept, a concept that applies to artificial networks for machine learning. That's where um, the concept was first developed. So, a Markov blank in that sense, a Markov blank of a variable x is just the smallest set containing all variables carrying information about x that cannot be obtained from any other variable. In a causal graph, this is the set of all parents, children, and spouses of X. Michael did, did talk about this yesterday as well. So these are kind of nets where Markov packets would have been used. And of course, in most of those basic nets, they would have represented some kind of concept or something that can be represented by a word or, or a proposition. And then you just work out the stati statistical dependencies between them. And the network can do some fun inferences. And Bayesian networks have been used in other areas as well, as kind of abstract um, models of gene regulatory networks. Um, some of the fossils of biology in the world might be familiar with this one. Um, by modeling causal and statistical re relationships between genes, but of course they're not really. Um, the gene regulatory networks themselves are not really Bayesian networks. They're not actually Bayesian networks. Um, all that the, uh, the Bayesian networks do, and this is one here, it's very abstract, is just give us an idea of an ide idealized representation of the structure of the dependencies and the nature, of, and in that sense, the nature of the physical systems themselves. But it's it's another move to say that they would have to be in the real gene regulatory networks, some extra kind of phenomenon, a Markov blanket that would be doing some work in that system. And that's the kind of move that makes me queasy. Okay. So, taking the quote that Michael put up from yesterday, uh, any organism will be defined this is me, Alan, Carl Friston, not by singular Markov blanket, but by a mere infinite regress of causally interacting Markov blankets. I think at this stage I just want to get a bit English and put my foot down the Anglo Saxon and just say, well, look, they're not ontological categories. That's not where they came from. They're not things that can causally interact. They don't have any causal powers. At best, they're idealizations. They tell us ideally something about kind of statistical interactions and regularities between um, different parts of an idealized network. But we should be taking that and then making it a way of trying to think about mind world boundaries and so on. Okay, so that's a critical part. No doubt there will be important to with that. But uh, I think that if we are going to go the full Markov blanket group that actually, you know, maybe we just discovered this thing first in this machine learning, but actually it's a much broader category that can be spread out across nature. We better do some work on that, right? We better find out what, how are we going to identify these things as you know, a kind of a kind of thing, something with causal power, something that's a furniture of the universe. So I think in that sense there's some a growing set of worries about the free energy principle of Markov blankets and how they occur in a lot of the literature that need to be addressed. 
And my initial response to these uh, worries is, yeah, they look worried. Right, now let's go on to so we get to the second part of the talk. Now I don't think the dark room problem is expandedly formulated as a problem for the free energy principle. So don't worry, I'm not going to run that argument. You'll be glad to hear. But just to remind you, uh, the dark room or dark cage problem, as it's sometimes called, is really just this idea that reducing free energy would be a bizarre strategy for um, success. Why don't creatures just retreat to a dark cave and stay there where it's all unsurprising. Uh, well, yeah. That, uh, oh, by the way, I think we should rename the dark room problem the radio head problem in my honor of one of their more famous songs. No surprise. Um, but um, I, I, I fully buy that the answers to the dark room problem have been given. We need to think of free energy minimization in the long run, over the long term, and not on these kind of short time scales. That sounds fine. But remember that part of Friston's response, and this is why I'm raising this, um, is again to give this tautological account of free energy. So remember this famous quote, a dark room agent can only exist if there are embodied agents that can survive indefinitely in dark rooms. In short, dark room agents can only exist, exist if they can exist. The tautology here is deliberate. It appeals to exactly the same tautology in natural selection. Why am I here? Because I have adaptive fitness. Why do I have adaptive fitness? Because I'm here. And that's crystal in this discussion. So far from the rest of Now, look. I just don't think that's right. Maybe some of the biologists in the audience and possibly biology will agree with me. I think it's just highly contentious. Uh, the you know, model synthesis is a very uh, successful scientific program, and um, it's not tautologies. Uh, much more complicated than that. So, you know, even Darwin's theory of evolution um, is more complicated than it's been. Um, made up by this and here. So you have to have variation in traits, you've got to have, those traits have to be heritable, you've got to have competition for resources, there are more offspring born in a generation than there are resources available, and you've got to have differential reproduction. Not all of them will reproduce. Um, those that have traits that are well suited to the competition for resources are more likely to contribute more offspring. That doesn't look like tautology. And you've got to be careful what you wish for when you say things. Like this, right? Because it's clear that this kind of tautology came about. Natural selection has been used in the armory and weaponry creations and creations. So here's a standard creationist argument. You may have seen this on various internet fora. Natural selection is the survival of the fittest. The fittest are those that survive. Therefore, evolution by natural selection is a tautology, a circular, defin a circular definition. Therefore, there is no such thing. Um, now, you know. Take on board John Wilkins' response to this. That's just wrong. Uh, Darwin meant not those that survive, but those that could be expected to survive because of their adaptations and functional efficiency when compared to others in the population. Um, that's not tautology, otherwise, force equals mass times acceleration is tautology. I think it's got point on. So I think there's an explanatory weakness in the free energy principles. It's Standardly formulated and rolled out. I haven't yet looked at uh, free fitness, but that will be next on the list. Um, it's supposed to explain both adaptive success and self organization. I think um, it does a good job of self organization. I'm not arguing against that. I think it's quite weak in its account of adaptive success. Right? Maybe it's just consistent with adaptive success understood as natural selection. Maybe that's what Friston's after, and that's fine. But I'm not yet convinced that variability in heritable characteristics, for example, can be understood in terms of free energy. Right? It doesn't explain heritability, it doesn't explain competition for resources, and it doesn't explain differential reproduction. So it's not going to replace Darwin anytime soon, if that's right. Okay, and then there's this rather more, um, 
I take that as fairly straightforward, but I'm sure we will disagree. But um, this is more controversial. So this goes back to the dark room problem. Uh, if the free energy principle, free energy minimization, is the only principle by which we understand adaptive success, avoid surprises, and you will last longer, as Kristen's shorthand formulation of this. Um, and then even if it drives an organism to be a model of the niche, as um, uh, came up in Yakov's talk when he was talking about the goats on the side of the mountain, uh, it still doesn't explain, I don't think. I mean, I, I don't yet see this as a very good explanation of why organisms left on what are for them unsurprising environments. They are already modeling in their phenotype for new and surprising environments. It doesn't explain why bony fish started flapping around on, the, on land and how that then eventually led, led to the evolution of amphibians. Right. But of course, actually, in real evolution, as it were, we have explanations. Linear explanations, we have gradual evolution over long periods of time. Uh, so, in the de development of complex islands, we start out with very simple Cambrian photoreceptors. And over long, long, many hundreds of millions of years, you end up with this complex islands. You can give a gradual, step by step evolutionary explanation of that. I'm not yet convinced that free energy minimization. Um, is going to replace that kind of story. And if it's going to, in some sense, supplement it, that's, I'm fine with that. But that doesn't make the free energy principle this all-encompassing universal type explanation that it's sometimes made out to be. There's also then a final kind of worry, a bit of worry about optimization, which is often referred to. Optimization in the brain? Yeah, maybe that happens. Maybe optimizing um, models is part of what brains are trying to do, what models of the environment uh, are, are trying to do. Sorry if that sentence didn't come out too But I, it doesn't help when we're thinking about, um, we're thinking about evolution. Right. So Tristan says, an organism is optimized to predict and inhabit an environment. Right. I'll know where I'm going with this. Again, yeah, shorthand, avoid surprise and surprise longer. It makes it sound like Golden Mountain never existed. Right. Spandrels of San Marco was never, never written. Um, there are all kinds of things that can get in the way of optimization and strategies. There are all kinds of constraints that have to be built in. There are all kinds of local optima, local minima that can prevent the evolution of better adapted solutions that might well exist in science space, but are not reachable by the field time. Um, and if that's the case, then we really should go back and take seriously, and he's written about this in, in actually in microcognition, right? Um, we should go back and take that into account. Um, so I think just to wrap up this section and get on the, um, the final part, I think that you know, we can go back to an old distinction in biology between proximate and ultimate explanations. Um, maybe free energy principle driven predictive processing is a useful new modeling technique for sub personal neural mechanisms, the personal level mechanisms. We go all the way up to consciousness, right? Um, but they're proximate. And are ultimate evolutionary explanations. Not they answer why, they answer how. So in that sense, it's not a, un a new unifying explanation for adaptive fitness of an organism. It's not an ultimate explanation even for the evolution of cognition. But it's going to be a useful part of that insofar as those proximate explanations can be part of a more evo devo type explanation of the evolution of the brain, for example, or cognitive traits. And that's what I want to get to. I had a worry that something I was saying wasn't being understood by Mark, but I'm just it. I'm talking to Mark about it. Um, <laughs> now, I think that this point actually has been taken up in a recent paper uh, 
by Ramstead and colleagues, which is just online. Uh, it's very good, actually. I just want to highlight the old te text. The free energy principle requires a complementary evolutionary, i.e. ultimate account, that explains the specific adaptive solutions. I think that's right. I think I said it a couple of years ago. In a, in a very short response to in the family. But uh, I think people who are trying to do predictive processing style work with free energy principle come around to that idea, which is that free energy principle on itself isn't going to do all the work. It's not itself the ultimate explanation. You're going to have to give some complementary evolutionary, in a sense, ultimate explanations to be able to get the job done. And I think that's the answer. So, how would that work in the context of cultural evolution? Uh, just to give you a very quick hint as to what's going on in the background here, in case you don't know much about this stuff, uh, you're all familiar with this kind of standard model of natural selection. I'm not going to say anything about it. The idea of niche construction and dual or triple, triple inheritance models is that rather than thinking that the environment just has a one-way influence uh, on uh, organisms and, uh, and genes, genotypes, we actually think of the organism itself as um, influencing its environment by partly constructing or altering it in all kinds of different ways. Humans are very good at this, uh, but lots of animals do it all the time. And that that has an effect on the developmental environment that uh, Rob Stotts, for example, has written an awful lot of very good stuff on. Um, and therefore, what's inherited is not just genetic material, mutations and fluctuations in that genetic material from your parents, but also your physical environment, which may have been altered by previous generations, and also your cultural environment, your cultural or social environment. All of those have an effect on the developmental environment or the developmental niche in which all of us develop a mature phenotype. So here cultural inheritance refers to things like knowledge, skills, artifacts, practices, institutions, many other things. And what's also inheritable is all kinds of variations in practices and things that people actually do, patterns of activity spread out across populations. But, so just to quickly um, simply do this. So, of course, you partly inherit your culture, your skills, your knowledge of your parents, but you also learn it obliquely from teachers and elders and so on. This is ripped off from Kevin Alland, actually. Uh, and horizontally, from uh, friends, uh, on specifics, who are just around you. So inheritance doesn't just have to be vertical in that sense, it has to be horizontal. And of course, going back to the idea of lineage explanations, gradual evolution in the homo lineage, in the human lineage, we want an explanation that goes back what's now being pushed towards three billion years ago in terms of, for example, this good um, empirical case, it's all using cultures. Mode 1, Mode 2, Mode 3, Older Mum, Achillean, Masterian, and then of course this incredible flowering, much more recently, of a uh, huge diversity of different kinds of tools. And that's been going on for a long time, so we need an account that tells us how we get from these kinds of cultures down here right up to the top, and all the incredible diversity that we get there with behaviorally modern humans. Part of that account has got to be how it is that humans can pass on those two using projects happening, pass on the skills and the artifacts themselves, how we can create them. So we've got to have all kinds of different ways of learning to shape, create these tools, and then deploy them. We want to start with something really simple like a kind of emulation 
we're aiming towards something more like imitation type approach to some sort of basic teaching, don't hold it like that, hold it like this type thing, gestural teaching, and then eventually, much more recently, of course, verbal teaching. And then, of course, teaching that incorporates external representations very recently, only a few thousand years. So I think um, we have to incorporate something like the cultural intelligence hypothesis of account that uh, Mike Tomasello is famous for. We're adapted to learning in social and cultural environments. Um, so we have some early developing sensitivity to learning from others. Now again, I, I, I'm not averse to the idea that there may be a, a useful predictive processing story that would help us understand this. Right? But I don't yet see how this kind of complexity is going to be explained in terms of free energy minimization per se. So we may have quite specialized issues for learning um, where there be all kinds of different artifacts and practices that are going to scaffold and shape our learning trajectories. Now, this is jumping through things very quickly. I admit that. But I think what we need is um, we need a developmental account of how it's possible for humans to acquire all the skills and capacities um, that are part of their cultural endowment and such. Um, now, one way we can think about that is in terms of uh, Boddington's classic canalization case. And what we want to think about is the evolution of um, reduced sensitivity of the phenotype to genetic and environmental perturbations. Perturbations in the environment or in the genes. And so, wanting to produce a kind of uh, metaphor, if you like, for trying to understand that, uh, that over time there would be a deepening of canals in the developmental land landscape over evolutionary time, which would be due to stabilizing the stabilizing effects of selection. So the ball rolls down the complex valley, making path choices. The rolling ball represents development over time, and the topography represents a regulatory environment that controls these choices. Now, one way of thinking about that is to add to the landscape um, in the way that is nicely encapsulated by Faber Gibronka here. Um, and thinking of a stable, recurring, uh, mature phenotype, or an aspect of the phenotype, this be a tra trait, is the effect of a dynamic network of developmental processes. So the developmental processes here are not just genetic, if we go along with the Jablonka style approach, or the kind of approach that Corolla and Paul have um, uh, championed uh, developmental systems theory, for example. I think it's consistent with, what I'm suggesting here is consistent with that. Um, we think about it in terms of what um, Rachel Brown and I have been talking about in terms of cultural canalization. It's the capacity to evolve a robust cognitive, in this case cognitive phenotype, via culturally constructed, at least partially culturally constructed, developmental channels. Um, Rachel unfortunately couldn't make the conference slide. I'm uh, hopefully doing a bit of what she would have done here. Now here's a nice kind of graphical representation of how we might think about that. So this is an idealization. <laughs> I admit that. Uh, uh, this is actually due to Rachel. I'm hopeless on these things. But um, what we want to think about here is yellow dots of genetic resources, red dots of cultural resources. So over evolutionary time, we add more cultural resources to the genetic resources. And what effect does that have? Well, the hope is that it results whoops, in the reduction uh, in the sensitivity of the phenotype to the environment over time. Right? That's the kind of Wallington style effect. And that increasing robustness allows uh, the development of the phenotype to spread out across the population. So you can find the same kind of uh, developmental processes for um, phenotypic traits or for the phenotype itself spread out across the population as these cultural um, elements of the developmental system become 
more entrenched. This is just some comments about the nature of canalization, which I can do questions if required. And what about, um, what about the free energy principle again then? Well, look, here's my first, admittedly, first past thought about this. Because um, I've been interested in the idea of free energy principle with evolution, and I wanted to see how would you come up with an account that could incorporate all of this nice work in niche construction, developmental systems theory, cultural canalization, um, without having a model that ultimately just reduces all of that and explains it in terms of free energy canalization. Um, so here's my first pass. I, I think that there's the, the first model I just said, more sort of, I'll call it reductive if you like, model should also be explored. I just don't think it's going to work. But it'd be interesting to see it. So, cultural practices may contribute to the minimization of free energy in the long run. That's fine. Um, but that's not a reductive account. It's not an ultimate explanation for why there's any culture or there are any cultural practices at all. So, the relation in that sense might be more. Exactly. Uh, if brains evolve to be predictive engines, and those predictive engines it happen to integrate tightly with cultural practices when they start coming on the scene, uh, then we may have a happy coincidence that both predictive engines, predictive processing, and cultural practices have locked together to produce error minimization as a consequence. Um, so this means that the free energy principle doesn't ultimately explain either biological or cultural adaptation, but it might encapsulate one of the proximate mechanisms by which those phenotypes develop, and therefore has downstream cumulative effects on the, on the phenotype, in this case, for example, predictive engines themselves. Now that's probably, I think, more important than it sounds if you take seriously the effects of niche construction over evolutionary time, right? Here's some niche constructors, termites and their mounds, uh, mole crickets, which of course famously Andrew talked about, and uh, Scott Turner talked about in his extended organism book. But why is it more important? Well, I think it's more important for this kind of reason, by the way, these are sort of precursors of niche construction, the ones in the world, dialectical biology, uh, in terms of feedback and evolutionary categories. Right? There's a quote from Sperelman's review of the Ogden Spindler Land and Feldman book. I'm just going to read the old bits. Oh, uh, what, what's going on with these feedback and evolutionary cascades is uh, niche construction often establishes a feedback loop that results in evolutionary cascades. So, for example, living in mammals influences every facet, facet of termite morphology, physiology, and behavior. Over time, that niche constructing activity alters the phenotype. Alters phenotypic traits. So even though cultural evolution is not ultimately explained by the free energy principle, it's quite consistent. Um, predictive brains like, and I think both Andy and, and Yapo kind of agree on this point, which is in itself interesting. Predictive brains like stable cultural practices and stable cultural environments. Although these may be the result of those environments may be the result of a lot of variation and complexity that goes beyond the free, free energy principle. Um, they also reduce the price on health to generate precision. So this complementarity would be no small thing on my story. Um, we could model cascades of niche constructing activity incorporating predictive processing explanations of brains. They'd be part of the um, explanation, just not all of it. So, we want to ask questions like how do predictive engines co evolve with cultural environments? That would be the kind of question I want to answer. So, just finally, then, um, this sees the free energy principle as a more local causal principle uh, that explains how predictive engine works. Pr predictive engines work, right? It really generates, helps generate those explanations. Um, not why there are predictive engines at all. Um, those details are filled in by evolutionary explanations, including, for example, niche construction or cultural evolution, um, inheritable variations in practices. So the free energy principle then is not tautology or a highly idealized universal law, if I'm right, and I'll leave it there.
I just wanted to reinforce what you're saying about evolution of the energy principle because I think there's something that clearly just isn't showing up in this literature that needs to show up. Okay? So fitness maximization 101, right? At every point in an organism's life cycle, resources have to be allocated either to building structure, maintaining structure, or investing in reproduction. So you're continually trimming off over the life cycle. The most basic trade-off is not investing in maintaining structure in order to achieve reproduction. That's why aging occurs. Right, okay, so organisms are continually, deliberately and adaptively allowing disorder to accumulate in these cells because it trades off against reproduction. Yeah. Okay? So if there's any sense in which the uh, staying far away from uh, thermodynamic equilibrium of your environment is the goal of the organism. It's not a goal of an individual organism, it's a goal of a lineage. Because you can then say, well, when they reproduce, that's just then going on the next generation. But that's not true either. Because if you look at evolution over phylogenetic time, over evolutionary time, if the environment poses problems that require you to become less ordered, you become less ordered. You see that in parasite evolution all the time, and in molecular evolution, if you look at the evolution of genomes over time. So just Evolution 101 does not involve the idea that either individual organisms or lineages of organisms are trying to continually trying to reduce the amount of thermodynamic disorder inside themselves. Yeah, I think that, well, that's put it very eloquently. I mean, I think that's right. I think that the the free energy principles it stands. Trying to do that kind of job is going to run up against too many cases like that. Uh, maybe kind of, maybe maybe free fitness or something is going to do the job, but it's hard to know. I think with the kind of optimizing strategies that are implicit or explicit in the methodology that Priston really employs, it, it just isn't going to be consistent with those kind of cases. There are going to be odd cases that you're going to have to really work hard to try and account for in a, in a way that will, I think, end up looking quite ad hoc.
will all turn out to be, if you like, minimizing prediction error relative to that, for that system. Just in the sense that that's what it takes for that system to stay in the state to define that system. So no wonder, I mean, there's no, in a way, it's, there's no surprise that there's no causal work being done here, because it's, it's just a description. It's just a description of systems that hang around. Um, so, I, so I just want to get clear about one thing there, which is that, uh, are you happy with this scenario then, which is uh, the free energy principle is just a kind of tautology or merely descriptive at very high level, very high level. Exactly. Uh, it doesn't make things happen. I think there's no yeah. I, I think there's a reason why Kristen chose adaptive fitness and not natural selection or any of those other possible things that you were talking about there. He wanted something where there was a, a plausible tautology there, as opposed to all immediate stuff that actually was sort of shadows to shadows mechanisms and they really does work. The mechanisms here I think are, are various. Loads of different mechanisms that manage to do free energy minimization over time. They have, you know, something has to be doing it. Um, maybe it's explicit calculation but, of prediction error and minimization of that for me over short time scale. But then it looks like, you know, really, maybe you, could death, have, you can have proximate, you can have proximate uh, mechanisms that minimize free energy. Yeah. Um, you can have predictive processes in the brain as well. That's fine. Yeah. But. It's, there's no um, general free energy principle which is going to explain it. It's just, it's just going to be a description of the principle that covers all of that, but it's not a mechanism. It doesn't bring that stuff back. No, I don't, I don't think I was suggesting the free energy principle is a mechanism, but I think there's a difference between the free energy principle being a mechanistic explanation or being either a tautology or a mere very high level generalization, descriptive generalization. If it's the latter, uh, it's probably not that interesting. Most of all the interesting work's going to get done at the level of prediction processing in the brain. There's a reason why it's only the appendix in my own book. Right. <laughs> but, then, but, then you, but then you need an account of how predictive processing in the brain fits into a broader evolutionary explanation, right? Yeah. 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 Good. Pretty good. So that was great, thank you. Um, I had a follow-up on what Andy wanted to do before here. So what is your what is your take on the relation between the free energy principle and the processing principle? So could it be the case that PP is the fact that it is either tautological or on irrelevant or like too too general in a way? Or would you see that PP is at least partially independent? Um, of the fact in order to do some useful mechanistic explanation. Yeah, I mean, uh, the wedge I was trying to drive there was between predictive processing and the free energy principle. So the pre, -en pre energy principle just turns out to be tautologous and descriptive. It's not very interesting. It's not going to do any of the kind of work that's been suggested for it. Um, well, and it's not good. Well, um, in the sense that it's going to drive the idea that we can think of. Uh, I mean, let's go back to the Christian quotes. Uh, it applies at any scale from the virus to the ecosystem. The underlying principle remains unchanged, it changed irrespective of whether we're talking about thermodynamics, a conscious brain, evolution of a species. All of those involved systems and all of those systems have to respect the free energy principle. That's, I think, all that's being said there. And it's not saying much, I agree. I just, yeah. if, that's, if that's all it is, it's not saying much, I agree. So, yeah. Very agree.
patient. I'm using it myself. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm using it myself, and I still call it bike because to me, one of the key elements of culture is, of course, that it's socially shared. And one of the primary problems for culture is that in order for it to work, we all have to be able to participate in it. And yeah. that's we have the same thing, cognitive. In fact, you can misunderstand what I'm saying when I use the energy principle. And we can still talk all day. Um, you know, but I have to at least, at least carry on. I think that's a, that's, a, that's a constraint on us. It is not the same as producing energy or optimal, optimality at all. In fact, I would argue that most of my classes involve a lot of communication of suboptimal, where students actually know what I'm talking about. But they are able to sit there through it because they're on Facebook or something. And it doesn't perturb their system. You know, like, so I think that you know, culture has a lot of things going on in it that don't coincide with it. So I'm just sort of struggling with that. I, I think you know, we can idealize the cultural transmission and miss yeah. a lot of the interesting stuff that's happening. No, look, I, I think that's why I mean, I'd like to say. There's a quick inversion you run through. So I'd like to leave you a story with regard to this. Because um, we may get quite a lot of variation in cognitive genetics. You know, um, so th this kind of work has been deployed on theory of mind stuff, which over at back's working on as well, right? And so here the idea is that you may get variation in uh, it's called a theory of mind or social cognition phenotype, depending upon what the differences in your in um, cultural variation in your developmental environment. So that would explain why, for example, kind of results that Mark the Rose name from this the Filipino kids show that um, at the right kind of age groups, four, five, six, they fail standard batteries for theory of mind tests. Right? Um, now, if you have if you have the standard kind of encounter theory in mind, which is everyone's just got the same kind of developmental program that um, produces the same kind of phenotypic outcome, um, it's hard to explain those accounts. You've got to come up with, well, there must be something weird going on, there must be some cross interference, etc. But if you have something like this cultural canalization style style approach, then actually it's quite easily explained, right? Um, it's quite easily explained because there's variability in the developmental resources. And that might create certain differences in the phenotype here. So we don't need to worry about universality. We get robustness of the phenotype, but we may get variation in the phenotype, in the sense that we call cognitive variation. Okay.